Right, I'm going to talk today about um, sort of the title of opening up um, environmental data science in the 21st century. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of people that have gone into this work. Um, and I'm going to mainly be talking from more analytical side of things, but a lot of the sort of underlying infrastructure and computational side of things have been built, built by a lot of people here, as well as some of the scientific insights. So um, let's kick off. Um, so in environmental science in general, we face quite a few different challenges. So some of the things we look at are complex feedbacks and interactions. So this is just a schematic of the system. You can see you have interactions with the soil, the trees, um, the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. And then also in with these complex interactions and feedbacks, you have inherent uncertainty because often we have to resort to models um, to simulate or understand our data. And then coupled in with that is we have data on varying, varying spatial scales. Um, so you can go from like in this example here, um, city level up to complex global models. So in often dealing with this, we can't just rely on one area of expertise um, to, to tackle the problem. We need to bring in experts from very different domains with coders, non-coders, decision makers, policy makers to sort of fully understand the system. And so with that, that often brings some um, sort of wide termed cultural challenges to multidisciplinary working. So the top bullet point as I've highlighted here is how do we bring sort of often we need statisticians to fully understand um, our data and gain insight from this the ever increasing masses of, of data that we have. And often statisticians and environmental scientists work in different domains, work in different computational environments, different languages, and also deal with different sets of data. So often um, statisticians deal with a single time series or lots of different time series and environmental scientists will work with complex, big, messy data sets that need um, sort of clearing up for um, machine learning algorithms to be applied to. And then with that is how do we ingest, store and engineer this messy data to enable method application and development? And more importantly, how do we share this between the different, different users? Um, we've all had the situation before where we struggled to get code working on our own machine that we've got on GitHub or found on Stack Overflow or a solution like that. And then the next level is how do we share and visualize our results with different stakeholders? Because like I said, not all your collaborators are going to be expert coders. So how do you get them to understand your data processing steps and your what you've done with the data and also communicate results? And this goes on to the next point is how do we like work, work and develop methods with the different experts? And the final important step is how do we make it fully open and tell people what we've done because this is how science needs to be we need to state all our assumptions warts and all we need to say this we tried this this didn't work this worked so people can understand the decisions that have been made and how do we make our methods transferable so they can be used for different applications so apologies for this slightly messy plot but the intention was for it to be messy so this is the challenges of what i'd call a multidisciplinary workflow so here you've got four users for example you've got a data expert you've got a processing coding expert you've got a visualization expert and then you've got the outputs and then you've got the people that are going to use the outputs and as you can see from this graph uh, this plot things are sitting in different places often on different computers so one person say how do i interpret your data how do I get your code running? How do I access large volumes of data if I've got a slow internet connection or something like that? And then at the other side of things, you, I'm a non-domain expert. How do I access the analytics? And more importantly, how do I know what your results show and how do I interpret them correctly? So as you can see in the box there, the data is in different formats. Not all users are experts and programmers and coders. And it's often, often hard to share new code, like I said, because the number of all, any coder knows, you try and download a package, it takes a few hours to get working on your system, which can be a problem. So um, on to um, a solution. So the Jasmine Cloud offered a perfect solution, which I'll explain in a second, of, of building a, a platform that can bring all this together. Now, this diagram makes it a bit better to show you how you can have everything in one place and working together. So all, all the users and the end users access the system through a simple web browser. You don't need any specialist software to access the system. And then I'll explain more about what data labs are in a second. And as you can see on the right, you've got everything sitting in one nice place on the Jasmine Cloud, so everything's together. The environment's consistent, everyone's in the same place. And more importantly, everyone's working off the same version of the data, the same compute environment and the same code. So it keeps everything sort of, like I said, consistent and coherent. So 
why why the Jasmine Cloud? Why have we chosen Jasmine to, to, to use this, to develop this system on? So apologies to my uh, IT colleagues who've built this here, because like I said, this is not my area of expertise, so apologies if I've got anything wrong with this. But with the Jasmine Cloud, um, we utilise the infrastructure of the service so we can build a dynamic, a containerized platform with authentication. So this allows you to access it through the web browser. You don't have to have a Jasmine account. You don't have to go through the Jasmine access system. And it also uses the flexible nature of, of the cloud for, for dynamic dynamic process and large data sets when required. So you don't always need big compute. So you can sort of span out to big multiple nodes when you need it and then um, go back down to um, just a couple of processes when you just need a small data set. And then on top of that, it provides localized storage access on the system to, for smaller data sets. And then we have the underlying Jasmine object store for big data. We're talking terabytes of data here. And then you can also indirectly link to the group workspace on Jasmine and Cedar via the object store stated above. So that's why we, we've used Jasmine for this um, uh, platform. So I've mentioned data labs. What are they? So they're a transdisciplinary collaboration space. So an area for, like I said, different experts to come in and work together. They're based in the cloud um, using compute and storage to facilitate ease of access to these systems. In this case, the cloud is the Jasmine cloud, but they, the system could be implemented elsewhere as well should people choose, wish, choose to. And then, like I said, they're an environment to develop common resources to integrate with novel um, workflows or to share and integrate with existing workflows as well. And also, data lab allow, allow access to a variety of data, different analytical methods, and different assessment tools. And they're currently we're currently working on the functionality, but the idea is you can discover them through a sort of search interface in the system. And then, like I said, finally, it supports a wide range of stakeholders from different levels of um, we call it user abstraction. So people can come in at different areas depending on their area of expertise. So how do we implement them? This is a bit of a, um, a meta sort of a schematic overview of the system in general. So like I said, you have your experts come in, the domain users at the top, they have a web interface and you have user authentication. So this provides sort of a, a level of security over the underlying data. So you can choose, pick and choose who has access if there's certain limitations in the data. Then we sit in a cloud native system, this in case Kubernetes cluster. And within that, we offer four main things. We have modeling and analytics and tools. So you can work with raw code or you can use notebook technology. Or we have Zeppelin, Jupyter and um, uh, RStudio on offer. So we use R, Python, common languages, but we can, the system, because it's done on the unmanaged side on the cloud and they have the flexibility, other languages, open source, of course, can be incorporated. So we've tested Fortran in there. Julia, I believe, is currently being tested as well. So there's, you're not just limited to a certain particular language. Then we have the execution for, like I said, the big data. So we can do Dask and Spark and things like that. So they're making your code parallel easily for certain um, R and Python um, analytics. And then we've got the management. So you can use the notebooks and the data and they can be discoverable and shared. And finally, there's the publishing and the collaboration aspect. So we, this is where you can share your code with non-code non users through things such as, um, you can use the notebooks if you want, so you can have the narrative, or you can use our Shiny apps so they can explore the data, execute the code, but don't have to run the actual code itself. And then obviously it's full integrated with version control and dynamic and high performance storage. And like I said, Previously, everyone has to have access to the same data, workflows, code, and computational environment. So everything is consistent. So what with the data lab, you can have different styles. So you can sort of sense them that the idea of these things is they're not just fixed, they can be dynamic and they can evolve through time to be used for different aspects, different tasks. So if you find something you like in someone else's project, you can say, can I have a copy of your code? Can I share your code? Can I share your project? And then you can run that for your idea. So we can have um, a sort of research labs. So they can be centered around a particular project, for example, integrated land modeling. There could be a community lab. So if you've got a particular model like the Jules model or the Wharf Chem or the Unified model or UKCA, you could have a data lab centered around those for exploring those model outputs, um, uh, uh, processing your data, sharing it with your collaborators internally and externally. Or you could focus on a particular place. So you could focus on the river catchment or, for example, uh, the Morecambe Bay area. Um, and the final thing is you can have methods 
methods-based labs. So you can sort of center around a particular, and we call these methodologically enhanced labs. So you can develop a new statistical method focusing on change points, for example, or extreme value theory or something like that to explore data in new ways. And then again, those could evolve into project labs or other labs through time when someone wants to use that for a different method. And then finally, there are things such as teaching labs and hybrid labs. And like I said, these are dynamic. So you could evolve between different ones in time. So you could all start with a lab you developed for teaching a tutorial of how to use a new method, and it could shift into being a research lab over time as that method develops. And that's sort of where the hybrid idea comes from. So just to show that these things are operational and working quite well, all of these cases have been sort of implemented through the data labs infrastructure. And as you can see, there's a very, very big wide range of different challenges they've been used for. So for example, we've got the, um, uh, the EMET4 UK project, which is a very big model, and um, colleagues have um, used the object storage on Jasmine to make easy high performance access to up to eight terabytes of um, model data and allowing that to be critiqued, processed within the data labs infrastructure. There is um, a CropNet project, which is in, it's using integrated modeling for different scenarios. They've used an iterative design of the interface of the lab so you can access different codes and different systems. And then I'm going to present you in a little bit more detail. Uh, study today that I was involved with, and that's focusing on change point analysis. So this is developing a new way of evaluating climate models, um, and it's an integration of process-based models and statistical framework, and it's using the labs to bring some, myself, an environmental scientist by background, together with some statisticians to develop this new, um, a new approach for evaluating some numerical models. So to present this case study in a bit more detail, Numerical models, as we know, are often used to understand the dynamic environment because we can't measure everywhere, even with satellites that have good coverage, they don't cover everything. So often we have to use models which are sort of um, the best guess of representation of process in the environment they have. And that enables us to understand what's going on. And over time, with more computational power, things like Jasmine coming online, other supercomputers, we can run more complex models we can get better resolution, we can more put more processes in there, but inherently with all that, we have increased uncertainty. So it's a famous saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful, but you need to understand how useful and how applicable they are to the situation you want to run them in. So we do need robust ways of evaluating such numerical models. So the challenge we were faced with is um, a new approach in a, in a way it's different to your standard mean or um, RMSC or global statistics we call we'd call them so they're evaluating how well it's performing on average across the time series but what we want to focus on is how well they pick up sort of maybe the local scale events and hone on them on them a bit more I'm not going to I'm not going to go into too much detail on the statistical side of things here, but these are important events as well that we need to models need to capture if they're to be determined a good representation of reality. So for this, we thought this provided a good use case of the data labs infrastructure to develop, bring a statistician and environmental scientist together who did sort of, they taught the same language, but didn't talk exactly the same language in terms of processing data, dealing with messy environmental data, big model data. And so we thought if we have a high resolution model, it would be a, do a better job at capturing these local scale events. So how do we analyze this? So we proposed a new change point based approach of um, looking at these local scale events. Now, in short, a change point is essentially an abrupt shift in statistical properties, for example, mean or variance of a, um, of a time series. So as you can see these two plots on, in the center and the bottom left, the one in the bottom left shows you an abrupt shift in mean at time point 100, you can see the jump. And then at time point 100 in the middle one, it's an abrupt shift in, shift in variance. And you can look at other things like trend and or um, uh, mean and variance together. So there's, you're not just limited to these particular things. And the idea would be, if you see a change point in observation, you're confident it's a true change point, your model should in theory also be able to pick up that up well if it's a good representation of reality. So the plot in the bottom right with two time series. The top one is from the model, the bottom one is from the observations, and the, both have been stripped out for missed data. And you can see that the, um, uh, the dashed, horizontal dash, the vertical dash lines are the observed change points, and the um, solid dash lines on the blue time series are the um, models. And by eye, you can see a lot of them line up. You can also see that the model does miss a lot of them. So we, we propose a new method that looked at the similarity between the same change point with uncertainty. Like I said, I won't go into the details of the statistical method, but essentially we, we converted them into some fuzzy numbers 
and we looked at the degree of overlap in the system and to take home from this um, plot here is you can see the red and the blue triangles the better they overlap the, as in uh, which is signified by the gray area the better they overlap the better the model is doing at capturing the change points seen in the observations assuming the observations are correct so the idea you'd want on each of these plots is um uh you want gray triangles basically all around. That means you've got a perfect representation from your numerical model. In this case, we used the era five data set from ECMWF and some observational stations over Greenland. But we can do this method, but we need to make sure it means something. So at this stage, I work with a statistician to get the data into the lab, process so it worked with their algorithm, their change point algorithm, and shared the results. And we decided on some, uh, some uh, parameters and things like that. Showed the, and then we thought, right, we've got to bring our environmental scientists in. So we brought them into the show. We actually displayed the results through a shiny app because they weren't an R coder, because this is all done in R. So we shared the results and they said, oh, have you thought about this? It could be the start of a melt season. This could be a warm year. You could put more weights on this year. And the beauty of this method as well is because you're focusing on individual events, you can assign higher weights to events of interest that you know should be captured. So you're not just looking at average across the time series, you're just focusing on specific points and points of interest. And then ultimately we worked iteratively to hone the method and then come up with the final results, which were published in the paper earlier this year of a new approach. And like I said, the idea is the better that the gray of the triangles, the better your model is doing at representing these local scale events. So in theory, captures the natural variability of your system better. So like I mentioned earlier, demonstrate the different levels of abstraction. Lots of people work in very different ways. So on the far left, you've got the people like myself who like working with raw, raw R code or work. I mean, I prefer going a step behind that and using it R at the terminal, but you can work with R Studio so you can sort of see the code itself. Some people quite like working with notebooks. Notebooks are great because you have the code there. They're interactive. We use them fully collaboratively within the lab so people can come in and edit their area of um, expertise so you could collaborate on the same notebook and in fact we did that live in a workshop of another change point project where we actually said oh have you tried doing this so we actually used the notebook from the lab live in the workshop to, to run an analysis iteratively and also you can have the narrative to explain what's going on with the data and then the level above that is the R shiny app so you're exploring you can set the parameters of the, um, the change point analysis change the site you're analyzing explore the system but you're not you're not sharing, seeing a single ounce of code if you don't want to. You can download the code if, from the app if you choose to, but at the time, so this could be where you share it with your decision maker and they can interpret the results with the buy-in from the other um, experts in the system. And the important thing here is it's the same code analytical workflow across the board, so everything's consistent. And the final thing is you can share all this with your collaborator collaborators. And if they've got access to your particular lab, there's no installing all the packages, finding the data, checking the data is accurate, everything like that, because that's already been done. If, if I can run this notebook and I share it with you on the data lab, you can run this notebook as well, no problem at all, unless obviously the data labs are having a bad day and they crash or something like that. But that would be the only thing. Otherwise, you won't have to spend ages setting up environments. It should be seamless. And with that, I think I'll say thank you very much. If you do want to read some more information around the data lab, particularly the first paper it is sort of setting out a, a, a sort of narrative and a roadmap as a way forward to say this is the way science needs to go. We need to be more open because this system can allow, you know, warts and all, show your analysis, collaborate better and bring other people in to say, you know, this is what we've done. Have you got different ways? And we can compare ways. So with that, I'll ask any questions, answer any questions if anyone has any.